Thank you very much. And again, thank you for inviting me to this uh, excellent meeting. Um, so muscular dystrophies, we all know the standard events that occur, lots of intermysal um, fibrosis, fat infiltration, central nuclei, etc. Signs of muscle regeneration, so that the muscle is responding to degeneration by trying to regenerate, as shown here by a neonatal mitin heavy chain. We're looking at this disease, the fascio scapulo muscular dystrophy. Um, it's, it's described as descending, so it starts with affecting muscles in the shoulder and face, et cetera, as dictated there. Um, and it has all the classic features of a muscular dystrophy, muscle wasting. It has inflammation around uh, blood vessels, which is slightly unusual for a muscular dystrophy. But ultimately, even if regeneration occurs, you're still ending up with a very dystrophic, unhappy piece of muscle. But again, certain muscles are affected more than others. And this is quite a drastic example here of one particular muscle being very short while the other looks relatively okay. Um, genetics underlying FSHD, just very briefly, at the end of chromosome four, there are these D4Z4 repeats. In the healthy population, there are up to 100, 150 of them. They become very hypermethylated and epigenetically repressed. In FSHD type one, you lose these units. So you have roughly less than 10. You have epigenetic derepression. And why does that matter? Because each of the D4Z4s contains an open reading frame for a retrogene. So when you have the epigenetic derepression, you allow transcription of the retrogene it encodes a transcription factor called DUX4. And on a certain haplotype, you have a poly A signal, so you stabilize expression. So essentially, it's a toxic gain of function. A protein is produced, a transcription factor that's not normally present in muscle that has deleterious effects. So we were interested in just muscle regeneration in FSHD. And a few years ago, Seville de Morel created a transgenic mouse line. One version had 12 and a half repeats, so a wild type, a healthy configuration of the human locus. And he managed to generate a single transgenic line that had two and a half units, D4Z4 units, which is a pathogenic configuration. And there was no overt muscle phenotype, but there were other aspects that we could use to model. So we were interested in muscle regeneration in this model. And when we cause the muscle to regenerate, we could see that DUX4 was expressed transiently during muscle regeneration. So even though we couldn't see much expression in the muscle, when you regenerated the muscle, there was expression. Similarly, if you took the two and a half units and transfected them into satellite cells, they generated DUX4. So we could see DUX4 was coming from these units and satellite cells were able to express DUX4 from this shortened part. So we had a look at the regulation of DUX4. Essentially what we had was the DUX4 promoter, a reporter gene, and the rest of the genomic configuration with the poly A signal. Induced muscle regeneration in these mice, we saw that as we'd expect, PAC7, myoD, myogenin go up at the transcriptomic level during muscle regeneration. And again, DUX4 from the transgene was being expressed during muscle regeneration. Ex vivo, we can see that we got expression of beta gal from the reporter during satellite cell activation and proliferation ex vivo. So that the endogenous DUX4 gene can be expressed in satellite cells in mouse during regeneration. We were interested in regeneration in the patients. So we collaborated with Ravi Tawil and worked with Chris Banerjee. And we first wanted to have a transcriptomic assay of regeneration. So we'd done some RNA-seq. And from this, we found that the hallmark myogenesis, 200 genes that describe regeneration and muscle development. And if we took Duchenne muscular dystrophy just as a test, we could see that if you then use this transcriptomic signature, you could distinguish FS, uh, Mus uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy from control. And using this signature, if you had a piece of control muscle and a piece of 
Duchenne muscle, as you can see from the rock curve, there's an 87% chance that you'll identify the Duchenne piece of muscle by this, this signature of regeneration. And similarly, it works in FSHD. So we had seven transcriptomic studies from muscle biopsies of FSHD, of which we could see that four of them you could distinguish on the basis of higher expression of these genes. And again, on the rock curve, using muscle biopsies, there's a 76% chance that you could identify an FSHD piece of muscle from a control muscle on the basis of expression of these 200 genes that are related to muscle regeneration. So on a transcriptomic level, FSHD muscle is undergoing regeneration. Rabi clinician was also able to access patients. So this is just the details. So essentially needle biopsies from the patients, as you can see, reasonable numbers, 45 patients, and then staining for myosin heavy chain, neonatal, and h &E staining just to confirm they were regenerating fibers and then assessing the degree of pathology. So this is the kind of thing we saw on the right is developmental myosin heavy chain. There's two fibers highlighted and you can see they're basophilic and they have the classic h &E, um, hallmarks of a regenerating fiber. Some pieces of muscle obviously a lot more affected than others. Again, the box is highlighting the neonatal myosin heavy chain. And if you look just at higher power, you can see that this is, these are regenerating fibers. They're not denervated or um, degenerating or necrotic. They've got the plump nuclei. They've got the stippling from the RNA in the muscle fibers. These are regenerating cells. And the degree of regeneration was correlating with how bad dystrophic the muscle was. So how many signs it had, such as variable fiber size, central nucleation, et cetera. So the more the muscle showed signs of pathology, the more regeneration we could find. But obviously the regeneration is occurring, but it's not enough to stop the muscle ultimately becoming quite dystrophic. So we're then interested in how can we um, use our knowledge of satellite cells and regenerative medicine to enhance regeneration in this particular pathology. That was just the summary of what we said about the muscle. There is regeneration going on. It's quite a low level, but it's correlated with overall pathology. So some work we did with Chris a while back was looking at PAC7 genes. So as I commented, DUX4 is a transcription factor and it's got two homeia domains that it's using to bind DNA. There's also a Dux4C, which is just an inverted repeat that's slightly more centromeric. Normally, Dux4 seems to be having an important role very early on in activating the genome at the very early stages, at the four cell stage, etc. And then it's somatically repressed by being in these repeats, epigenetic repression to stop it being expressed again in disease, in FSHD. Changes in the genomic configuration allow you to express DUX4 again, and then that's what causes the disease. So you're getting a topic expression of this transcription factor in somatic tissue where you would not normally see it in an adult or later developmental stages. When it's expressed early on, it helps activate the genome. When it's expressed later on, it inhibits myogenesis and is apoptotic, causes apoptosis and also affects metabolism. So it has lots of different effects in the cells. Problem is it's very hard to detect it in patients. So even if you take the patient's cells, estimate might be that you can see one in a thousand cells with the protein. And even if you do very careful assessment, it's very, very difficult to see the protein. You can sometimes see its footprint genes because it's a transcription factor, but it's very hard to find ducts for itself. So it just makes you wonder how linked are the ducts for expression with the immediate pathogenesis. Why do we look at ducts for? Why do we get to this in the first place? And the reason basically is that the homeo domains of ducts for are very closely related to the homeo domain of PAX7 and PAX3. So obviously this elicits our interest with our satellite cell background and interest in 
PAX genes. And Michael Kyber years ago had this paper out where he said that PAX3 and 7 can rescue ducks for pathology in mouse. And even that you can substitute the homey domains of PAX7 for those of ducks 4 and still maintain some function of ducks 4. So we were interested in just saying, can we use ducks 4 target genes to identify FSHD muscle? You'd expect if it's a transcription factor that's causing pathology, then it will be activating its target genes. So we made three separate signatures of 100 plus genes in each. And then we made a signature of PAX7 target genes. PAX7 upregulates and downregulates genes. So we used a ratio of up and down regulated genes to say, is PAX7 expressed active in a particular muscle? What's happening to its target genes? Um, there are lots of studies out there of FSHD using transcriptomic analysis of muscle biopsies. There was one that came out last year, which was particularly interesting, where they used MRI to guide the biopsy. So they know they're sampling from muscle that is badly affected. You can just see from this image here, healthy on top, FSHD below, 31 year old person. You can just see how different the MRI images are. Um, and when we looked at this particular data set, fit in with other data sets in that you could use PAC7 target gene repression to identify FSHD from control muscle as well as each of the three ducks four signatures. As you can see here, again on this rock curve, the chances of you identifying a piece of muscle is from an FSHD patient, as opposed to a control on the basis of PAX7 gene repression, or ducks four target gene activation is up in the 90s. So they're robust markers. If we look in certain mortalized lines from patients, we can see PAX7 is expressed there, and the FSHD ones have ducts four, so that the two proteins are in the same place, or the two messages are in the same place at the same time. And here we just took a ducts four reporter gene. If you put ducts four into the cell, then the ducts four reporter gene is activated, as you can see here. If you put PAX7 in, it doesn't activate, but important, if you put PAX7 and ducts four together, then Dux4 loses the ability to activate its target gene. Okay, these are two different reporters and this is an endogenous gene. Similarly, if you have a PAX7 reporter gene, you put PAX7 in, you activate the PAX7 reporter gene. You get a little bit of uh, activation with Dux4, but if you have the two together, then you do not get activation of the target genes. So the presence of PAX7 and Dux4 together mutually inhibit the ability of each gene to activate its target genes. And Massimo in the lab is looking further into these interactions. So if you have a cell that is expressing ducts 4 we know it leads to all these differences of stopping proliferation, causing apoptosis, inhibiting differentiation, etc. Ducts 4 c will help ameliorate this, as will PAC7 on the proliferation. So the presence of PAC7 can ameliorate the effects of ducts 4 to a certain degree. So it does appear that they can compete, interact in some way. Um, that's just the summary there basically, saying that PAX7 target gene repression is a biomarker for FSHD. And that PAX7 and ducts 4 seem to be able to interact. So we're interested in then which pathways are affected? Can we affect satellite cells to improve their regeneration? If we think that satellite cells may express Dux4 during the regeneration, that is gonna have deleterious effects on satellite cell activation, proliferation and repair of FSHD muscle. So there are some useful tools out there. So a few years ago, it was shown that FSHD myotubes are different from controls, you get different phenotypes. So you can find cells that have a trophic, they form smaller volume myotubes, and others have a phenotype that's described as disorganized. So I have a minute a left. Thank you. So this gives you a readout then of myogenic differentiation, obviously an important step in regeneration. And especially useful are these mosaic cell lines where you have clones, muscle clones, 
from the same patient. And then you can analyze those clones and you find some of them are hypotrophic and the FSHC ones are hypotrophic. Whereas the ones that from the same person that don't have the contraction because the patient is mosaic form healthy big clones. So this gives you a powerful way to just compare the effect of the contraction and the ducts for expression in an isogenic cell line against cells from the same patient, but without the contraction. And we did some quite in-depth and expensive RNA-seq. So we looked at eight time points through differentiation of two of these clones, one from the one, both from the same patient, one with the contraction and one without, and then did RNA-seq at various time points in triplicate. And lots of things obviously changed, but one thing that jumped out were that you saw lots of changes in mitochondria and mitochondrial genes. So the 500 most suppressed genes, this ERR alpha receptor and PGC1 alpha were the things that jumped out as perturbed during the myogenesis in FSHD. And just to pick those two out, you can clearly see the PGC1 alpha is repressed all the way through in FSHD. ER alpha is not repressed initially, but then kind of catches up. And essentially ER alpha is a transcription factor and it's important for generating mitochondria as lots of other roles in energy metabolism. And PGC1 alpha is a cofactor, so it needs to bind to ER alpha to activate it. So these two are closely linked. And we know from the PGC1 alpha null mice, deficient mitochondria and have elevated ROS and the ER null mice, less um, mitochondria deficient regeneration. So we know that if you affect these pathways, you affect muscle regeneration. Um, and we were interested because there are these isoflavins out there that can bind ER alpha and activate it in the place of PGC1 alpha. So it's a nutritional supplement. So hopefully it's an easy accessible way. And this is um, just showing you essentially if you knock down PGC1 alpha, as we'd expect from the transgenic mice in human cells, then you see hypotrophic myotubes. But if you add biocanon A to substitute for the PGC1 alpha, then you can recover the myotube size. Um, again, if you then look in FSHD, so you don't have to knock down PGC1 alpha because it's already lower in the FSHD cells. Again, biocanon can rescue the myotube differentiation. So essentially what we think we've got is you've got control in FSHD because you've got suppression of this particular pathway, you're getting hypertrophic. But if you add biocanon A, you can rescue the ER alpha activation to again restore size. Um, we're now going to more detail over on the um, oxidative metabolism, mitochondria, et cetera, because there's obviously quite an important angle here as well on the energy metabolism, et cetera. Um, and let's like thank the people who did the work. So this is the lab. This is how they look now on Zoom all the time. And obviously the people who give us money to do all this. So we'd like to acknowledge them as well. Thank you very much. Pete? Does that mean that you that you can actually prove that the antioxidant antioxidant clinical trial is working via that to have some improvement? And why the FSHD patients are all many of them are taking oxyantidant cocktails is having an effect? Yeah, I mean the, the clinical trial, the primary outcome wasn't achieved. I think that was a six minute walk test, but there were strength improvements. It was a seventeen okay. week trial. Yeah. There were strength improvements. It had positive effects. Um, but it was a kind of general antioxidants and not particularly targeted. That's right, yeah. So it was a vitamin C, I don't know, vitamin, anyway, selenium and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, it, I think it's it's, poss it's worth pursuing because we can clearly see that there's mitochondrial yeah. dysfunction going on and it's affecting reactive oxygen species, things like that. We know already that they're affected and these cells are much more sensitive to ROS. So there's a whole pathway on mitochondria out there. So that's that's why we're particularly interested in that. So you could really target uh, with with this biocanin A or other even more efficient, you could really have some target which could have an effect. That's what we're hoping. I mean the biocanin not treating, A, but but not curing but treating. Yeah. Well that's the thing. I mean and right now we know that um there's the bias the mitochondrial biogenesis. You need lots more mitochondria when you differentiate. But it's combined with also the function of them. So again both pathways, more mitochondria helpful, yeah. and then 
maintaining their function integrity as well.